One of the hallmarks of sport is ironically a sense of fairness, that everything is on the level. All participants have an equal chance. But as we all know, sometimes the game was rigged from the start. Now, we're not counting down the most controversial decisions, but we have done that, go check it out. No, today we're looking at 10 figures in the sport who got the short straw not realizing they never had a chance in the first place. These are the 10 times someone was royally screwed out of something they deserved by unfair circumstances outside their control or another party not playing by the rules. I'm Tommy from MMA On Point, and these are MMA's 10 biggest screw jobs. Number 10. Bob Meyerowitz by Nevada. Everything in this entry should be considered with a picogram of salt, which is why it's been placed so low on our list. In the late 90s, Bob Meyerowitz and SEG were hemorrhaging cash, trying to keep the UFC afloat. TV exec Leo Hendry told Bob that the sport would need to get sanctioned in Nevada in order to get major pay-per-view backing. So in April of 1999, Meyerowitz and company were set to give a presentation to the Nevada State Athletic Commission, but asked that their portion of the day's meeting be canceled. From here, things get a lot bit murky. In an interview segment that was later retracted and pulled from the broadcast by CNBC at the behest of Zufa's legal team, Bob claimed that prior to the meeting, the commission was going to say yes to MMA, but at midnight, Meyerowitz got a phone call telling him to cancel the meeting tomorrow because one commissioner wasn't on board. And that commissioner was? It, it turns out that commissioner was Lorenzo Fertitta, that he had changed his mind. Zufa released a statement contradicting this version of events and said the final cut of the interview done by CNBC made it seem as if Fertitta had somehow blocked a vote and then the next day snatched the company from underneath SEG, knowing full well as soon as he did, Nevada would sanction MMA and everyone would get fucking rich. Let's just say there's a reason CNBC pulled the clip. There was supposed to be a meeting in April of 99. Fertitta was a member of the board. However, no vote was planned. This was simply meant as an exploratory meeting. In fact, Fertitta and other commissioners started regularly attending events and forming relationships with UFC personnel after this in an attempt to learn more about the sport. There were reports that SEG would then ask for a vote in the summer, but the request simply never came. Outlets at the time did claim that there wasn't enough support from MMA in Nevada, but there were several members that weren't on board with this idea yet, and there's never been any indication that one of them was Lorenzo. Fertitta would leave the commission to take his role as president of Station Casinos in August of 2000. That next January, Meyerowitz did sell the UFC to Lorenzo and his brother Frank, but it should be noted that Zufa actively campaigned and pursued sanctioning for seven full months after that, including flying John McCarthy out to convince the commission before MMA was sanctioned in Nevada. Yes, Fertitta's past relationships with the commission certainly helped them when it came time to vote a year after he left, and some Something compelled Meyerowitz to cancel that meeting, believing he didn't have enough support. Something compelled him to never do a follow-up with NSAC in 99 and 2000, before it was simply too late. As much as it's a great story, the idea that Lorenzo masterminded this in April of 1999 doesn't fit. That said, whatever Bob's reason for believing Nevada would say no did spell doom for the promotion, when approval most certainly would have saved it, at least for a time. Number 9. Mike Goldberg by the UFC. Loyalty means nothing these days. From 1997 through to 2016, Mike Goldberg was the voice of the UFC. There long before most fans even watched the sport. He was a staple, an institution. Goldie and Rogan were as much a part of the broadcast as the Octagon. Which is why when new management WME IMG unceremoniously ousted Goldie from his 19-year commentary chair in 2016, fans cried foul. Even more so when Goldberg wasn't even allowed time for a proper send-off on his final broadcast UFC 2. I will be friends with Mike Goldberg to the day I die. Can't I love get that the guy, guy a sign off though. I, did, I, I didn't mean, know what to do. Can't do one of those old weird animal videos. They didn't want to, man. According to Mike, there was no communication, no explanation. He was just done. A week later, Goldberg broke his silence and said his goodbyes via a Twitter post, which shockingly mentioned me in it. The commentator would move to Bellator that next June, where he remains today. Considering how long he was a major part of UFC broadcasts, and even allegedly turned down huge money to no-show a pay-per-view, and instead work for the WWE full-time, it's just not right to drop him with literally no acknowledgement whatsoever. No video package, no thank you screen as they went off the air, they didn't even let him end the broadcast with It's All Over. Number 8. Kevin Randleman by Alabama. It doesn't matter how often I watch this fight, it's still ridiculous every single time I see it. Let me take you back to the late 90s. It's UFC 20. Kevin Randleman and Boss Rutten are fighting for the vacant heavyweight title in Birmingham, Alabama. The bout is judged on a whole, so if it goes the distance, no points per round system is in place. The judges just decide who they think won the fight. Despite smashing Boss's face early on and literally controlling from a dominant top position for nearly 95% of the 21-minute fight, the other 5% of the time mostly spent on Randleman's six successful takedowns, two out of three judges awarded this thing to Rutan. It doesn't matter 
matter what era you consider this fight, there's absolutely no way you could watch it and say that Kevin Randleman lost. It's one of the most ridiculously bizarre decisions in MMA history, and the monster got screwed straight up. But it was more a product of the era and the state having no idea what a winning fight really was in a sport that was rapidly evolving. Hell, Meyerowitz said it was one of the best fights he ever saw, and that makes no sense. This went way beyond a bad decision. Now, he did win the title in his next bout against Pete Williams at UFC 23 after Boss retired and vacated, but that fight very much should have been his first defense and not his second chance at the belt. Number 7. Ian McCall by Math Uncle Creepy had all the makings of a big-time UFC star. He was talented, charismatic, a great interview, a strong social media presence. He had everything you could want. But eight years after his debut, he's most famous now for the terrible luck that plagued his career. Things really started when he got screwed in his UFC debut against Demetrius Johnson in the four-man flyweight tournament. After an awesome and incredibly close fight, DJ was awarded a split decision victory. But somebody skipped second grade and counted up the cards wrong. The fight should have been a majority draw, and with the special rules of this flyweight, Weight tournament, there should have been a sudden death fourth round. Instead, there was a rematch that Johnson won unanimously. Now, it's easy to say, look, he got a second chance and blew it, but beating up one of the greatest fighters ever for a round is not the same thing as an entirely new fight. His bad luck started there and only spiraled after that. Had he won and become flyweight champion, who knows what doors would have opened for him. Better training, better partners, sponsorship money. Look, DJ had Xbox for a while. That one round could have changed his entire life, but we'll never know because somebody couldn't do it edition. Number 6. Tom Lawler by USADA His nickname may be filthy, but it was USADA who did him dirty. From an out-of-competition test in October 2016, Tom Lawler got hit with a two-year ban hammer, and two months before his suspension was up, the UFC gave him the axe. The crime? 17 picograms of Osterine. Now, you might remember that word picogram from that time Jeff Nowitzki and the UFC moved heaven and earth in order to get John Jones sanctioned for his title fight at UFC 232 in Nevada. I mean, California. The gist of their song and dance being the amount in his system was so small, it couldn't possibly enhance his performance, and Jones had more than 17 picograms. What about that other word, though, Osterine? That's the drug that at least nine fighters have been suspended for since Lawler's failure that only received six-month suspensions after new testing policies and findings deemed their use accidental due to the trace amounts in their systems. You know, like 17 picograms. USADA released an official, our bad, statement, saying Lawler received the standard sanction at the time for his violation announced in 2017. If this case arose today, he might have been eligible for a lower sanction and would have had the ability to challenge to an independent arbitrator to determine the final consequence. I'm sure their half-assed admission of fault made up for the year and a half of his life that was taken from him. Number 5. Nate Diaz by the UFC now, I'm not saying that the Diaz brothers can't be hard to deal with, but Nate was underutilized and underpaid for a long time. If you watched our history of Nate Diaz versus the UFC, you would know that the Stockton native was getting 20 and 20 before the Connor fight. That's $20,000 to show and 20,000 if you win. The only reason he was able to negotiate more was because they needed him on short notice and McGregor was a big star. Prior to that, despite fighting Benson Henderson for a world title, despite featuring prominently on five big network television Fox cards, Dana White was never convinced until UFC UFC 196 that Nate was a quote unquote needle mover. I mean, not, he's Nate Diaz the, is not a needle mover. I love Nate Diaz. Nate Diaz is actually one of my favorite kids. Now, we all know that was clearly not the case, but the nightmare eight fight contract Diaz signed prior to his bout with Henderson in 2012 wasn't even good mid card pay. And the then contender was under the impression the terms could be renegotiated after the Bendo fight, something the UFC refutes. Some shows were 15K, some were 20K, but given his star status now, it's insane to see how little he was making during that period of time. His beef with the UFC did in part help to popularize his anti-authority attitude and persona, but given the circumstances, I'm sure Nate would have just preferred the money. Number 4. Guy Mesker by Pride this is probably the closest approximation on this list of the concept of a pro wrestling screwjob, so how fitting that it would be in Pride FC and feature pro wrestler Kazushi Sakuraba. It's the opening round of the 2000 Grand Prix Tournament, and one of the most highly anticipated and important matchups in MMA history will take place in the quarterfinals, so long as Hoist Gracie and Sakuraba win tonight. Hoist was taking on Nobuhiko Takata, so that was pretty much a lock, and Kazushi would face Guy Mesker, who came to Japan on two weeks' notice with a bum wheel. The injured guy only agreed to 
to do the fight because he was told it would last 15 minutes and not a second more. The bout wasn't one you're gonna tell your grandkids about, but anyway you cut it, Mesker was the clear winner, which is why it was super weird that all four judges scored the fight a draw. Even weirder when Pride officials declared that there would be an overtime round. Mesker's Lion's Den brother Ken Shamrock lost his shit and ordered everybody from his team to walk. Saku was declared the winner via retirement, and that May he and Hoist would have one of the most important fights in MMA history. Thanks, Pride. Sorry, guy. Number 3. Mark Hunt by Brock Lesnar and the UFC one of Zufa's big UFC 200 wins was the return of Viking warlord Brock Lesnar against fan favorite Mark Hunt. The deal was cut only a month before the show, so the UFC got USADA to skirt the rules about being in the testing pool for four months. Don't worry, Mark, I'm sure Brock is as clean as they come. Lesnar looked good in his return, scoring a decision win over Hunto in his classic ground and pound style, but Brock and the UFC weren't done beating up on Mark. As it turned out, the Beast Incarnate had failed two separate drug tests for estrogen blockers once before the card and a second time the night of the event. The fight was ruled a no contest, Lesnar was fined $250,000 and suspended for a year, but he just retired and fucked off back to pro wrestling with his $2.5 million payday. Can you see me now? Hunt felt like he got hosed, even if he probably suspected Brock was on steroids and something like this might happen for him to capitalize on. He'd spent a lifetime fighting and complaining about drug cheats. Josh Barnett, Alistair Overeem, Ben Rothwell, Bigfoot Silva. But this one was different. Lesnar had failed his test before the event, and Mark planned on getting even, requesting the UFC give him all of Brock's purse. When they were like, nah, we're good, Hunt took Lesnar, Dana White, and the UFC to civil court for racketeering, fraud, obstructing fair competition. He threw the book at them, but unfortunately for Mark, the judge threw that book in the trash. Most counts were thrown out, and a final ruling awarded Hunt absolutely no damages. I'd hate to see what his legal fees were. Poor Hunto. As of late April, though, Mark plans on filing a new suit against the promotion, but no word yet on what that might be. Number two. Daniel Cormier by John Jones. In so many ways, John Jones has screwed over Daniel Cormier. It's damn near his life's work. There was, of course, the two times their fight would need to be rescheduled because of Jones, once from an injury, and a second time three days before UFC 200 when Bones failed the drug test, forcing DC to fight Anderson Silva. There are also the two times John beat Cormier in a fight, the first time legit, and the second time in brutal fashion, with his post-fight reaction memed for all eternity, only to be overturned because of another failed drug test. There was the press conference brawl, the constant back and forth on social media, but more so possibly than any of this is how Jones has loomed over Cormier's entire legacy. DC won the light heavyweight title after John was stripped following his hit and run, and despite defeating Alexander Gustafson, Vulcan Ozdemir, and Rumble Johnson twice during his reign, the fact that Jones had beaten him and was stripped led many to unfairly underappreciate the accomplishments Cormier achieved at 205 pounds. He wasn't the real champ. In any other era, DC would be the top dog. And while he's carved his place into heavyweight history, he'll forever be compared to his most bitter rival. Number 1. Michael Bisbean by Vitor Belfort There were many victims of the testosterone replacement therapy era that started quietly in the mid-2000s and ended with a bang in 2014, when Vitor Belfort's terrifying three-fight TRT-fueled murder fest and commando levels of testosterone led Nevada to banning therapeutic use exemptions. By far, the fighter that got it the worst, though, was Michael Bisbean, who suffered a retinal detachment at the leg of TRT Tour in their 2013 matchup. The likes of Luke Rockhold and Dan Henderson, who was also a member of the TRT club, by the way, felt the wrath of the resurgent phenom, but Bisbean's injury would eventually lead to the Count losing his eye altogether, a heavy price to pay, so that a depleted 35-year-old Vitor Belfort could fight like he was 19 years old again, despite his past history with PED usage, the likely reason he needed TRT in the first place. When Michael's good eye started having issues in 2017, he was forced into retirement. You could argue he was on his way out anyway, but it was only a year and a half since he'd won the middleweight title, and because of the kick by Vitor, he didn't have a choice. Belfort and his unfair advantage had too much say over Bisping's future, and that just wasn't right. Huge shout out to the pride of the West Midlands, Tom Moore, for putting his editing sorcery to work on this video. Follow him on Twitter at TomMJMoore. Thanks for watching. Please give us a like and subscribe. We've got three new videos or more for you every single week. Let us know what you thought of the video in the comments below. Follow On Point MMA on Twitter and have yourself a wonderful day.